Alright everyone, time for an evening drive down the golf course. It is 7.55 p.m. in the central time zone here in Houston. So I got about 30 minutes of twilight, dusk before it turns dark on me. Plenty of time to take a ride. Let me adjust my camera angle here based on how that tree looks. Because I think I'm off to the side just a little bit. There we go. That's, that angle is okay. Alright, so. I ride this bike several times a day and I really enjoy it. It's a uh, good way to get some exercise. It's electric, so if I get tired, I can just buzz on back home. It's a big sur made by AMA, so it's from China, but it's a really well built, really good bike. I've described before that it has a torque sensor rather than a cadence sensor, so it's a completely different feel. Nothing wrong with cadence sensor bikes. Whoa! A little gust of wind. Nothing wrong with cadence sensors. You know, like uh, another brand that I've looked at was going to get, but backed off of it was called GOAT. So greatest of all time. Uh, they make a series of e-bikes. A uh, little slightly higher price point than this, but it's like a 70 volt battery. So not quite the 72 volt that big that the Surons are on, but not anywhere near the 48 volt that this bike is on. And they go uh, they go uh, 50, 60 miles an hour. To me. 50 miles an hour is really fast on a bike. Like, I, I don't know. If I need to go 50 miles an hour on a bike, I may need another type of vehicle. But, you know, there's people that, you know, that's a prime feature that they're looking for. Oh, look at this fishing bird. This is the retention pond for the golf course. Um, it, uh, holds all the water that they use to water the golf course to keep the grass green. It all drains back to here. So they have to add freshwater makeup, you know, because they lose some to evaporation. But um, they are able to, you know, recycle quite a bit. And they usually have three fountains going. I see one looks like it's clogged up. They've got two going. Those two keep it uh, aerated. You keep it aerated, you know, it keeps from getting all murky. And the dissolved oxygen is up high enough to where fish can uh, breathe. And if you have fish, you've got turtles and you've got fishing birds, ducks, the whole nine yards. So it kind of kicks off the whole ecosystem of the area. So in a few of the larger bodies of water that are part of the retention of the pond system you'll see that they're aerated and you know a fountain looks good too right looks good and it actually releases negative ions into the air which makes the air smell good so that's why people like to be around waterfalls all the negative ions that get released. You can smell it. Supposedly makes you feel good. I'll just see if I'm wrong. Sometimes these people get real mad at me being on the golf course. Hello. When they won't uh, give me any room, they're usually looking for uh, trouble. 
my golf cart broke down there. Yeah, I've learned to read the signs. Like, if they won't give me room, I'll just, uh, I'll just move. It's funny because my personality, I'm not like that. But it's just not worth it. Like, I, I've had people yell at me out here. I had one lady, she, I'm pretty sure she called the cops on me. And I'm like, you're calling the cops on somebody riding a bike on a golf course? And I live on this golf course, right? Like, my backyard is the golf course. So, I mean, I pay taxes and a lot of taxes. And you're telling me I can't ride my bike on a golf course. Now, I understand when golfers are out there, you need to be respectful. But the argument is it's dangerous, right? What if you get hit with a golf ball? And I guess, you know, they're protecting themselves in a lawsuit, right? Because I could sue them and say, oh, you let me on the golf course. And then I got hit in the head on a line drive. But I wear a helmet. I, I, get, I need to have like a reverse camera where y'all can see me sometime. But the way my camera, my phone set up, uh, you would just see my my big belly gyrating back and forth. So I, I don't I don't do that. But I, th I thought about getting like a higher mount camera where you could see me in like a little picture in a picture. I thought that might be kind of cool. Still looking into it, but you know. The problem with that is it would articulate all these little bumps, right? And, uh, and I think it would just whipsaw, and I don't think it ever stayed steady. So if I got something that would stay steady, that's going to be such a substantial mount that uh, it's just not worth it to me. So, so I just keep it like this for now. But I would like to be able to turn it up, turn it to the side, get the wide angle view wider. I've got wide angle view on, on here. So, uh, talking about these e-bikes, that goat goes really fast. I'm just not interested in going that fast. Plus, it, I don't think it pedals well. Like this Big Sur, it's a real bike. Like, like you can take the battery off of it and it looks like a real bike and it feels like a real bike and uh, I enjoy it but the torque sensor is just a better experience I had a Hemaway before this loved that Hemaway put damn near 3,000 miles on it but it had a cadence sensor and it's just a different experience it's kind of like if I could describe the two a cadence sensor is off or on and a torque sensor is analog so Cadence sensor of one or zero. You're either pedaling or you're not. Torque sensor, zero to a hundred. It feels how hard you pedal and it adjusts accordingly. So if you really want to get it, pedal hard, it'll kick in more pedal assist. But if you want to go real slow, which sometimes I want to do, that's what makes it nice. This is the same course I took last night, running to my brother-in-law. Oh, and I see the dogs out, so I'll see him again. I'm just going to wave at him tonight. We didn't cover all the brother-in-law updates last night. He's a really good brother-in-law, though. Just a real genuine person. I, uh... I married into a good family. I can honestly say that over four years later, I married into a good family. It's a trip getting getting married late in life. It's a trip. I was married 26 years the first time around, but I don't want to get all into that the details but let me just say that the last decade really wasn't being married it was 
at times it was okay, but we, I think we were just trying to keep things together for the kids. And I know you're not supposed to do it. And if we had to do it over again, I don't think we would have done it. But the good news is me and my ex get along just fine. It's only after all the drama's over, how you can just let it go. Cool. I was thinking. Hmm. Yeah, this is another pretty lake. I mean, they're all man-made here on the golf course. But there's another fishing bird. I believe they're herons. There he goes. Hey, I didn't mean to disturb you. Please let me know, man. motor winding up. That's why I'm not pedaling as much. So this whole time I've been going, my battery's at 100%. I've been trying to pay attention to my battery more. And what I do is I uh, I uh, don't charge it up every time. Like you're kind of you know, your tendency is every time you come home, you want to plug the bike in plug the battery into the bike so the next time you get on you got a full charge but guess what that's not good for lithium ion batteries you need to let them I feel like you need to let them float between say 40 and 80 percent and topping them off is just not great for the long term trajectory of the battery if you think about it it's just a container of electrons you know the more electrons the more voltage there's something about when you pack it full that it's uh, just not good for the long-term health of it. But I, uh, I often do pack it full. But... And in my last bike, I could tell, I could, I could tell the battery was starting to give out. And uh, and I did that. I charged it to 100% every time. And then I, then I learned, I learned about how you're really supposed to do. It. Now, next level battery care is I store my bike in my garage, which gets pretty hot. Next level battery care is not only do you only charge it to 80%, but you uh, you take it inside and let it stay cool where it never heats up. Because, you know, batteries are chemical reactions. Chemical reactions tend to be exothermic, but they're all endothermic at the end of the day. By that, I mean, if you put enough heat on it, you're going to cause something to happen. Oh, there's people out here. Oh, they're just walking dogs. Beautiful sunset tonight. You can see some red in it. That's from being told by the weather people that there's Saharan dust in the atmosphere and uh, that's why we're having red sunsets and it's also like having something to do with weather weather patterns which has kept any more hurricanes from hitting. We had hurricane barrels come through. Did a number on my house. I'm in the process of getting everything fixed. I got uh, I gotta get a new roof, I gotta get a chimney rebuilt. I got some interior chimney work to do. It was a hell of a storm, man. It blew through and it knocked the capstone off the chimney and it fell on the roof and dislodged some architectural elements. But at three, four o'clock in the morning, that sound of a capstone doing a swan drive on dive onto your deck of your roof. It's one hell of a noise. And I walked out there in the middle of the hurricane with a flashlight trying to discern what happened. There's no power. And all I could see is a big tree fell on the house. I didn't know how bad it was. 
as it turned out, it wasn't bad at all. I mean, other than chimney collapse and my, my roof being damaged by the wind. But the tree really didn't hit the roof. It just almost hit it. It uprooted, right? So the ground got really wet. The wind blew very hard. The tree leaned over and the roots pulled out of the dirt. That's what they mean by uprooted. And, uh, but it, it did not do like a hard fall. It, it did what I call a soft fall. Soft fall because the roots are tapered, right? So by its very nature, as it's pulling out of the wet dirt, it is uh, a little bit of a gradual pull or a gradual fall. So that gradual fall spared my house. Insurance company canceled me right afterwards. They said they're not doing homeowners insurance in Texas anymore because we have too many natural disasters, hurricanes and tornadoes. And so I got to find a new insurance company, STAT. My insurance agent tells me that it's going to be hard in 2025 to get homeowners insurance. And then by 2026, you may not be able to get it except for from what they call an insurer of last resort, which is some bottom feeder company comes in, barely covers anything, charges you too much, and it's just the bare minimum. But it's catastrophic, right? Like, like if a tree falls and hits your house, it's probably all on you. Their, their deductible is going to be so high that they're, they're not going to cover it. But um, if, a, if your house burns down, completely down, then it's a catastrophic loss of COVID. That's because statistically, that's a very rare event. But here in Texas, tree falling on your house is not a rare event. So, but that's got big implications when insurers stop insuring housing in, uh, in your state because you can't insure a house, you can't get a mortgage for the house. Because there's no investor group in the world that wants to take on the burden of financing a house that could be destroyed. Because no matter what, if, you, if you're in a house and it burns down, you're not making that next note. I mean, who, who would keep paying on a house that doesn't exist anymore so they want you to have insurance because big day of reckoning coming the day we can't the day that, that, that new housing starts are affected by the ability to underwrite them and finance them it's going to have big implications on our economy because new housing starts is a gauge of how well the economy is going to do because if you start to build a new house there's a whole lot of things we know are going to happen shingles wood paint hardware doors windows light fixtures lights appliances carpet flooring there's just a whole industry on top of an industry on top of an industry that's what new housing starts does make so when new housing starts start to drop it doesn't happen overnight, but the economy's going to drop next. I wanted to show you all this fountain. Now, I don't know if the people that own this house paid to upgrade this fountain and that's the coloring at their house. I suspect they did. But uh, look at this fountain, man. You know, those other ones I showed you, the fountainhead... I think it just had one nozzle. This has, to me, it looks like one main nozzle, about five to six medium nozzles, and then about eight smaller nozzles. And then they've got two accent lights, one green, one red. Nice looking setup. I guarantee you this is very aerated, lots of fish. 
That's everything. Oh, let's see. Got to watch out because they rope off the trails. I don't want golf carts running up on the grass. So they, they'd rather you stay on the path, but that's not what people do. You can see they reinforce this bridge, but it just doesn't hold up well under the weather. And it is pressure treated wood, but it's not very well. I think they pressure treated it because it doesn't look good at all. And this wasn't that long ago. This was like maybe a year and a half ago they did that. Here's part of the retention system, that tank. It is actually probably the big source. Everything pumps into that tank. That's nice they try to recover the groundwater that they uh, irrigate with. I know they lose a lot to evaporation because it's so hot here. But with high humidity, that does limit evaporation. If you're in the desert doing that, your makeup would be like 50%, where I bet it's about 15% here. I'm gonna go down this little path and then circle back to the house. I'm not a big fan of uh, riding when the golf course is pitch black. Uh, not that I'm concerned, like I, I never see anybody, especially that's up to no good. You know, every, it's a nice neighborhood, good, good people in the neighborhood. But um, I worry about what's laying out in front of me on this path. And yeah, I have a light on this bike, but it's, you know, if I'm going very fast at all, it, if I were to see something on that light, it's kind of too late. I might be able to swerve. So, like, right now, I can I can see ahead of me enough where I'm okay with it. But in about 20 minutes, it'll get pitch black on this golf course. Because there's no lighting on this golf course. And it's heavily, heavy trees. So, this path, there's a canopy of trees, you can see, almost through the entire path, almost the, the entire golf course. People light up their backyard with a cushion above. I've got one of those backyards that's pretty well lit. I have already ridden 417 miles on this bike. I've been riding it a lot here lately, though. It's just a good way for me to get exercise. You know, I'm documenting all these rides with these videos. And so, what I think is going to happen is... Okay, I'm going to go one more. One more part of the path. And then I'm turning around. I'm thinking like 500 years from now, my great, 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 great grandchildren will find my YouTube and go, Hey! I was related to this guy. And I'm thinking, I wonder how they'll see me. You know, like in the future, it's going to be radically different. Think about how things were 500 years ago. So in the 1500s. I mean, we were in the Iron Age. Coming into the Bronze Age, right? We were starting to mess around with printing presses starting to understand civilization building. The Catholic Church was still running things. We we're exploring parts of the world. We brought pigs to America. See, I just hit something in the trail. That's this is why I don't like a ride. <laughs> we bought we brought turkeys to America, right? No, we bought pigs to America, turkeys to Europe. <coughs> we brought potatoes to Europe, which caused their big population boom. 
between the turkeys and the and the potatoes. They didn't have that. They had pigs, but they didn't. They weren't doing much with the agriculture. And guess what? Because the damn pigs like to eat the corn or whatever seeds you put to try to grow something. They, at night, they're out there digging it all up. And so when they brought pigs here to America, we jacked the Indians up with that. Because the Indians, you know, look, the, I know some people say it's racist or whatever, but Indians weren't real good farmers. They were what you call river delta farmers. <clears throat> the only time they could get something to grow is on river deltas, like the most fertile, optimum growing conditions. They could they could get a little bit to grow. And then we brought pigs, you know, because they, they put pigs on ships because they breed so fast. And you bring five or six pigs on a ship of, say, 30 men, and uh, they'll breed so fast that you've got food. You've got a natural source of food. I mean, they're trying to fish and stuff too, but <clears throat> every once in a while you can slaughter a hog have some pretty good food for a while. All right, I'm going on the street now. I don't know what this joker's doing. He's got flat. He's probably waiting on triple A. Uh, so yeah, and then we brought potatoes over there, right? And that started a movement in Europe. <clears throat> Between turkeys and potatoes, they finally started having population growth. You know, coming out of the dark ages over there and with the plague, the black plague and all that, their population had been decimated. Plus they had them harsh winters. And they had been decimated. So potatoes brought them back to life. And it all went well until the Irish, they went all in on potatoes. Like, they loved it. They had potato stew. They had fried potatoes, boiled potatoes, mashed potatoes. They were like Forrest Gump or Shrunk, right? And potatoes are one of those things you can eat. I'm not saying that they're super nutritious. I'm not saying they're a superfood. But if all you could eat was potatoes, you're going to live, right? Because it's, it's got just enough, especially if you eat the skin. And so potatoes is something that you can feed a lot of people with and keep them alive and relatively healthy. The problem is they got completely dependent on those potatoes and then the great potato blight happened, which caused the Irish famine to happen, which is why Irish people flocked to America, which is why the North won the Civil War, because they put the Irish put a gun in their hands and said, if you signed up on our side, we will make you a U.S. citizen. Right there at Ellis Island, they did that. And so, that's why they flooded down through Virginia and all that, fighting for the, uh, fighting for the North. The North would have never won. All because of potatoes. So remember that when you order a large fry. What a big impact that's had on the world. I mean, back then, people weren't slaughtering cows, right? Like, I think the only cows, like, they originated, just like the potato, they originated somewhere in South America, and then they spread. And then the Scottish, like, really took on cattle, right? And that become a big part of their thing. Now everybody is, like, beef-dependent. That's why, you know, like, I don't like all that environmental political talk. I don't like it. But that's why they talk about cows contributing to CO2 or whatever. It's because they, they do produce a lot of gas. And we were never supposed to have this many cows. But guess what? We were never supposed to have 24-7 all-you-can-eat hamburgers. Like, that's not how this world was supposed to be set up. We're supposed to be, you know, hunter-gatherers that started planting crops and, you know, started building buildings, but we're supposed to stay lean and mean. Now we've got, think about it, you could drive around Houston and order hamburgers all night long. What part of reality is that? If you don't think we live in a bubble in this country, 
a bubble of affluence and excess. Just think of how many cheeseburgers one man could ride around town and get. Imagine if it was back in the 1500s. So I started this conversation saying, what's it going to be like in 500 years? Who knows? We, technology's left so far, so fast, I don't know what's next. I really don't. But I think it'd be cool if these videos still exist. And a descendant of mine hears me talking about my perspective. So when you find this video and you're wondering what exactly I am doing here, I'm literally just documenting my rides. I'm not trying to be some super influencer. I'm not trying to make a million dollars streaming. Um, I'm just documenting my rides. I don't know how long I'll do it, but I think it's kind of cool. I think years from now I'll look back and go, that was a good time in my life. That's what I think. And you always regret that I don't have more video of my parents, and especially my grandparents. And I never met my grandfathers. Like, I don't know how they talked. I don't know how they looked. I don't know what their opinions were. I just hear stories about them, and I formulate my opinions. And I can tell you that it almost brings a tear to my eye because I really wanted to know my grandfathers. I benefited from having a really good father that really taught me a lot. He was a good, solid man. And uh, he was married to my mom for 55 years at his death. And mom died 12 years, 12 days later. And I believe it was a broken heart. But I always wish I would have known my grandfather. I knew my grandmothers. I was very close to my maternal grandmother. Very close. But I never got to know my grandfather. So, so maybe some, you know, descendant of mine will be able to at least get a glimpse of what his genetics are like. All right, everybody. I'm going to turn this off as soon as this guy passes me. All right, not too bad.